And we are so thankful that you are all here uh, for our study of the book of Hebrews. And here we are, it seems like just yesterday that we started, and we are already in Hebrews chapter 7, which is truly one of the most pivotal chapters of the book to really understand. And so we're going to have to put on our thinking caps tonight and trust the process as the author leads us through um, this book because he's developing his argument in a way that we're following. And we've, we've realized by now we have to trust the Lord to, to help us to understand as we go. And this chapter is going to be one of those that we're going to be challenged by in a very enriching way. It's just uh, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer because we do need the Lord's help. Father, we love you and we do thank you for your word. And we thank you that you are a God who hears our prayers. We give you glory and praise and thanksgiving, Father, uh, for Elsie's good report. We know that that was a gift from you to her and what a privilege it is to be together here connected from all our different homes and places able to give you the praise and thanksgiving um, that you are due father you are a god who is attentive to our needs and you have invited us to cast our cares on you because you care for us and we give you thanks for every answered prayer this week for every answered prayer as we go throughout our lives and father we thank you for Jesus because it is through Jesus that we can come confidently to you with our requests. And it is through Jesus that you appropriate your power. And Father, as we rejoice um, in his lordship, we are reminded through Hebrews 7 that he is the great high priest that you sent, Father, to represent our needs before your throne. And I pray that you will help us through this study this evening to understand that what that means to each one of us both today in this present age and also eternally and so father just if there is anyone here who uh, has had a busy day or is distracted i pray that you will calm our hearts and our minds and just to allow us to be attentive to your word and i pray as we study that you'll search each one of our minds and our hearts to bring clarity where there might be confusion and Father, we just uh, commit this evening to you and pray that you will be glorified and that each one of us will be edified as you speak to us through your word. Father, we give you thanks and glory and we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you haven't opened up your Bibles yet, you may want to do that. Just be opening up to Hebrews chapter 7 and Hebrews is way back towards the end. I mean, it's just uh, it's right before first and second Peter uh, Which our life groups I believe are going to be studying in the spring. So uh, that's really an exciting uh, Time for us to be able to go from Hebrews to first and second Peter And then of course you got first second and third John and then we've got Revelation and guess what we're also going to do in the spring We are going to study the book of Revelation and so we're going to be spending a lot of time in this area of the New Testament, which is perfect timing for this present age because we are getting ready for the return of Jesus. So be thinking about that as we prepare for this next study. And uh, the book of Hebrews is a message that we need to fully understand in order to move forward in our understanding of Jesus in the times that are to come. It's a, uh, it is definitely a, um, it is a, a message that needs to be understood. So I'm thankful for all of you who are here. Um, you, there are no no thrusts here as we learned last week, only um, spude, spude. You guys are being diligent to study uh, your word, the, God's word. So we're very thankful uh, to have you here. Let's go through our abbreviated review of this book. We are in the book of Hebrews and, oops, sorry. And we are, uh, we have already determined that we don't know who the author of Hebrews is. We have plenty of guesses there, but we're comfortable with the date of around AD 62. And we know that the recipients, as we've been going through this book and keeping this in mind, that he is writing to, in the first century Jewish Christians. These Jewish Christians had a lot of familiarity with the uh, 
with the Old Testament and the Mosaic Code that dealt with the priest and the temple rituals. And so what is second nature to them is a little bit different for us in our modern context. And so that kind of tells you why the flavor of the book of Hebrews is very acclimated to those of the Jewish tradition and not as, you know, we're not as familiar. Um, so it, it's a little bit more of a stretch for us but this, it applies to all of us because no matter what your background is, Jesus is the one true Lord and Savior of the world, and he is our high priest. And so we need to understand this part of who Jesus is. This is our outline for the book of Hebrews. We're looking at the majesty of Messiah's first, his person, in chapters 1 to 6. Then we, uh, we've already looked at that. We concluded last week this first section. And so now we've moved into the second section, uh, which begins with chapter 7, where we're focusing on the majesty of Messiah's priesthood. And then we'll close up with his perfecting power in verses 11 to 13. And the purpose for this is to prove the superiority of Messiah's person and priesthood in order to exhort the Jewish Christians in the first century who were considering turning back to the old Jewish traditions to press forward, stand firm in Messiah, and to press on towards maturity. So this is really a good context to understand this particular chapter. Now in verses, uh, in chapters one through six, we focused on the superiority of, of Jesus's person. And so you want to keep in mind what we learned from these chapters is that Jesus is superior first to the former prophets. We saw that in Hebrews 1. Chapter 2, we saw in, in, in chapter 1, he is superior to the angels. Chapters 3 and 4, we saw that he is superior to Moses. And then in chapters 5 and 6, we saw that he is superior to Aaron, who was the first high priest of Israel. He was Moses' brother who began the order of the priesthood under the Mosaic Covenant. And so each one of uh, these entities or people represented a tradition that was familiar to the Jews and even to the Jewish Christians in the first century. Uh, so today what we're going to now begin is the second section. We're really going to focus on the priesthood of Jesus and why it's different than the former traditions and the implications of that. And so uh, we're going to start out first. The author is going to speak towards the fact that Jesus's priesthood is superior to the former Levitical priesthood. And we'll see this in this chapter and, and keep that in mind that this is what the author is attempting to prove that Jesus's priesthood is completely different than what came before. And the, what came before was the Levitical priesthood, which was in the order of Aaron, who was the first high priest. And so you can kind of see why he finished the first section, proving the superiority of Jesus to Aaron, because now he's moving into the implications of that. What are the implications? Jesus's priesthood is superior. And then we'll go on into the covenants. And so, uh, and of course, before we move on, we want to be cognizant that there are some serious warnings sprinkled throughout the book. There's going to be five warnings in all. We've already covered three of those, which are a bit frustrating when you're really wanting to get into the richness of the doctrine of Christ. We have to keep stopping and having these warnings. And so we've already seen the warning against drifting. We need to pay attention to what is in God's word so that we don't drift from it. Uh, the warning against disbelieving in falling away from the living God in Hebrews 3 to 4. And then the warning that we just finished in chapter 5 and 620 was the warning against degeneration, where we, we kind of close our ears to what God has to say. And so we don't want to be sluggish and lazy and dull. Instead, we want to be attentive to what God has revealed. And before that last warning, the author was attempting to introduce 
the doctrine of Jesus's priesthood that is in the order of Melchizedek. And then he had to put the brakes on. He got our, we were really engaged in that. And then he put the brakes on and stopped with this warning. And so I've been going, okay, we have been warned, but I'm ready to get back into the doctrine. And that's what we have. So I'm glad you made it through the warnings. You know, it looks like we had some casualties, but we really have, and I pretty much know where everybody is. <laughs> and so uh, it also helps that the recordings go out. And uh, people are very kind to send me emails to let me know, hey, I'm not going to be there. And that is very helpful when you do that. Um, but uh, so you can keep up with, but, so I'm not really making fun of if they're not here. It's not because of the warnings, but I'm very thankful for those of you who are here because you persevered. Um, you are spude, and that's a good thing. And so we, uh, we're going to move in now to the richness of the doctrine that the author wanted to introduce to us back in chapter five, and he closed up chapter six, uh, again, introducing the idea, but we're going to focus on the significance of Melchizedek. First, in his own preeminence in verses 1 to 10, and then secondly, the implications in the priesthood of Christ in verses 11 to 28. So get your thinking caps on. We've got to go back to the first century in a different context, but this word is for our instruction. We're going to learn to draw near to God through Jesus. And that is what a high priest allows us to do. That's the function of the high priest. And so let's begin with the preeminence first of Melchizedek in verses 1 to 10. Now, as we're going to be focusing in this section on what it means, what, what is the significance of the priesthood of Christ, I want us to, again, just review the difference between a prophet and a priest because it helps us to better understand what a priest is. Okay, a prophet is someone who represents Yahweh, the Lord God, to the people. And so a prophet speaks for God to God's people. And in the case of Jesus, who is a prophet, even in his being, he revealed God to God's people. That's different than a priest. And now we're not focusing on Jesus as a prophet, but instead as a priest. And what does that mean? Well, a priest is someone who represents the needs of humanity um, to God. And so the priest mediates. So there's an intercessory role of a priest because a priest is searching the needs of the people and then bringing those up to the Lord. And of course, Jesus is the high priest and he is the one who represents our needs before God. But we do have a priestly function. Anytime you pray for one of another, you are uh, functioning in that priestly role. But Jesus is the high priest and we are very thankful for him. And so that kind of is, a again, preparation for this text. And so now that we've gotten beyond the warning of the degeneration that we covered in 5.11 to 6.20, we're now going to move forward to discover the significance of what the Old Testament, Old Testament introduced in Psalm 110.4 that's repeated twice in this chapter, where God has sworn with an oath that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So who or what is a Melchizedek? Can you even say that? That's such a big word. Melchizedek. Okay. Melchizedek. And so let's take a look at verses one to three. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So the chapter begins with the word for, which indicates it's referring back. It's saying, you know, if you say for and you draw a conclusion, it's kind of like therefore. It's pointing back. And so it's pointing back to explain the order of Melchizedek 
that was mentioned in Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, where we concluded the chapter saying, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So that was last week in Hebrews 16. He was warming us up for chapter 7. Now verses 1 to 3 tell us that Melchizedek is not a what, he is a who. He is a person. He is a very mysterious person. He was a priest that himself only appears in scripture one time, and that is in Genesis 14. Now he's mentioned in two other books. We have a mention of Melchizedek in Psalm 110.4, which is the messianic psalm that says, the Lord Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You, speaking of the Messiah, Jesus, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So here we have out of the blue in the Psalms written a thousand BC, this mention of Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And I'm sure that had to be a mystery throughout the ages. And we only knew of, of the story of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. And then we see him in Psalm 110, and there is a bit of a mystery. What is this about Melchizedek? And then we find out in Hebrews 7. We've heard him mentioned more than once in Hebrews, but now chapter 7 is where we get to find out who he is. Now, in order to understand who he is, we have to go back to the days of Abraham, which is back 2100 BC, around that time. And Abraham was dwelling in the promised land of Canaan, which is the land of Israel today. And he lived more specifically by the Oaks of Mamre, which you can see is there uh, close to Hebron. Uh, it's the blue arrow to the far left. And his nephew, Lot, who had come with him to Canaan, he had gone down to live south of the Dead Sea in the Valley of Siddim, which you see south of the Dead Sea, uh, the bottom blue arrow. And he lived in Sodom. You know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, this is the Valley of Siddim. Well, during this time, and it's recorded in Genesis 14, there was a powerful coalition of Mesopotamian kings. Mesopotamia is off our map. It would be east of, of Israel in the Levant, that area. And they, these kings came, and they conquered the Transjordan tribes of Rephaim, Zuzim, Emim, and the Horites. And you can see those different kings represented on the right side. It would be east of the Jordan River. So if you see the Jordan River, and they're the arrows that have the red tip. And so these are what we call the Transjordan tribes, or tra I'm not, not well, there are tra Transjordan kings who were living in that area at this time. And so these Mesopotamian kings from the east came over and they conquered these Transjordan tribes. This conquest led to a revolt of those uh, four different kings in the Transjordan, and that revolt led to their subjugation again. These Mesopotamian kings came, there was a big conflict in the Valley of Siddim that you see south of the Dead Sea, and in that process, uh, the, the Transjordan kings were defeated and Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, got taken hostage. He was taken as a prisoner. Now, here is the land um, that we're speaking of where this conflict took place. Uh, this is a picture of what is believed to be the Valley of Siddim, south of the Dead Sea. This is where the conflict between the Transjordan kings and the Mesopotamian kings took place. And we see this recorded in Genesis 14, it's an intro. I want to give you a little background so you could appreciate the record of it in verses 13 to 20. This is in Genesis 14, where it says, Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew, and that he was telling him about Lot being captured by the Mesopotamian kings. So this is what Abraham did. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, 
the Amorite, brother of Eschol, brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men born in his house, 318, which isn't very many, uh, only 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Dan would be up in the north. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pushed them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. Verse 17, then after his return from the defeat of Kedar Laomer, the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, here we have Melchizedek, only mention of his appearing in scripture. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave them a tenth of all. So Abram, if we look again at the map, he was in Mamre, um, and he heard that Lot had been taken captive in the conflict between these Mesopotamian kings, Transjordan kings, south of the Dead Sea. With only 318 men, Abraham pursues them, and he defeats these Mesopotamian armies, and that is north of Damascus, which would be north of Israel. So following this defeat of the foreign kings, Abram met Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Well, we're told that his name means king of righteousness. And it tells us he was the king of Salem or Jerusalem. Jerusalem could have also been, I also read a commentary that said it might have been Shechem. Um, and that's possible. But what we do know is Salem means peace. So Melchizedek was king of righteousness, that's what his name meant, and king of peace. And Melchizedek was priest of most high God, which he would be Yahweh. So Melchizedek blessed Abram, and Abraham paid Melchizedek tithes. And so what we have in Hebrews 7 is it's explaining this prophetic significance of this encounter between Melchizedek king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of the most high God, and Abraham, this is 2100 plus BC, which also explains the messianic prophecy that we have in Psalm 110.4. So Melchizedek only appears three times in three different books, uh, Genesis 14, which we've just studied, then Psalm 110.4, which is the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament is Psalm 1104, very clearly a messianic text. And then we have an uh, explanation then in Hebrews that begins in chapter 5 and really is clarified in chapter 7. So Melchizedek is, is a bit mysterious, so we need to understand in, in, uh, in Hebrews 7, all through the ages, since 1000 BC, when it was revealed that Messiah's priesthood was going to be in the order of Melchizedek, they must have been wondering, what? Yeah, what is that? And we finally get to Hebrews 7, and he says he's going to tell us. And this is after we've been warned about being dull and degenerate and, uh, and drifting. So you're here, and what they wanted to know all through the ages, we take for granted, but we have that revelation here. So let's dig in and see. What do we learn first about Melchizedek? And we are told that he was, we've kind of reviewed this in, in verse 1, king of Salem, Jerusalem. He blessed Abraham in verse 1. Abraham paid him tithes, verse 2. His name means king of righteousness, verse 2. Salem means peace, so he's king of peace. I guess he was king of Jerusalem, so he means king of peace. He was without father and mother. In verse 3, that's what it tells us in uh, Hebrews 7, 3. And also in verse 3, he had no beginning and no end. And then also in verse 3, that he was made like the Son of God, a priest perpetually. 
So now that that's what we know about Melchizedek, the high priest, what are the implications of that? We'll have to flesh that out. But it's good to have that in your mind as far as what do we know about Melchizedek. Well, this is, this is all we know so far. Now, verse 3 says that Melchizedek was made like the Son of God. So in what ways was Melchizedek like who's the Son of God? Jesus. So in what ways, when we look at this list, was Messiah, um, was Melchizedek made like Jesus? Was Melchizedek Jesus? No. Well, you know, there's actually some, there's, there is a view that it could be a theophany or a Christophany, but in, uh, we don't, I don't think so. Uh, this appears to be a real person. Uh, but so he, and it says he was made like the son of God. And so that wouldn't be a theophany or Christophany. But in which one of these descriptions now do you see ways that he would be made like the Son of God? Let's take a look at that. What do you see? He's king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yep. What else? King of righteousness. King of righteousness. Yes. And I don't know that Jesus, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means salvation, but he is the king of righteousness. In other parts, there's Messianic prophecies that do identify him that way. Um, what else? No beginning, no end. No beginning, no end. Yep. A priest perpetually. A priest perpetually. Very nice. So that was kind of the ones that I had picked out. And so there's some differences, although I even looked at uh, blessed Abraham. Y'all probably couldn't hear, but they were giving the correct answers. I was really, that was good. Uh, They blessed, it says he blessed Abraham. And I'm not certain that we don't see, if you go back and look carefully in Genesis, I'm not sure that there isn't a Christophany where Jesus may have blessed Abraham. But, uh, but we don't, we're not given that as clear as we would need to, to make that assumption. Uh, and so Abraham paid tithes. We'll see the significance of that without father and mother, Jesus, we know God, the father, his father, mother, Mary, that would be a difference. And, uh, he says Melchizedek was out without genealogy. Jesus, his genealogy is very carefully recorded in Matthew one so that we, we know his lineage because that fulfills, shows us, indicates fulfillment of, of. Uh, of messianic prophecy. So, so are they saying that they just don't know who it is? What his genealogy is? Or who his father or another? Like it's, not it's not recorded. So we, God knows, obviously, yeah. um, but we haven't been given that information. And so when we look at the prophetic implications of that, he has no father and mother. And there's no beginning. It doesn't tell us about his birth. It doesn't tell us about his death. So that in, indicates that there's no beginning, no end, and he's a priest perpetually. So it's kind of looking at how Scripture revealed Melchizedek and the implications. What does that tell us? He was not Jesus, but he was a type of Christ. He was a type of Messiah that pointed to truths of Messiah. We, know, we can make that very clear assumption because he appears in Psalm 110.4 where it says Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So it's the way that Melchizedek is revealed prophetically to point us to Messiah and his role as high priest. Um, and Catherine got that too. King of peace, priest perpetually, no beginning, no end, king of righteousness. Um, that would be That would be it. So now keep in mind again, to kind of acclimate yourself, why is the author establishing this? He is setting out to prove the superiority of Jesus's priesthood to the Levitical priesthood, which was under the old Mosaic code. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Jews that need to be able to move forward and follow Jesus as high priest as they followed um, those priests under the Mosaic code. So he's proving the superiority. In verses four to six, He says, now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced 
from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. So we have to unpack that. If you're reading that going, okay, that, that just sounds, that's a difficult, you know, passage. Okay, let's unpack it. We're, set, we're seeing now the contrast developed between the Levitical priest under the old Mosaic code and now Melchizedek. This is a new priesthood. So we're seeing now that being contrasted. The sons of Levi under the Mosaic code, they are the ones who received the office of priest. And they were given a commandment under the Mosaic law to collect a tenth from the Israelites, who would have been their own brothers, because Levi was a son of Abraham. And he became a tribe, and that was the tribe of priests. So Aaron and Moses and all of the priests had to come from the tribe of Levi. And they were given a command to collect a tenth from all of the other tribes, from their brethren. And so what does that, what does that tell us? What is the implication of that? It tells us in verse 7. It says, but without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So the conclusion is, is that the greater blesses the lesser, and the lesser pays tithes to the greater. So what does that tell us in this incident? Who blessed who? Melchizedek blessed Abraham. That's right. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Who is the greater? It says in verse 7, the greater blesses the lesser. So between Melchizedek and Abraham, who is greater? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Now, who paid tithes to who? Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Exactly. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and it tells us that the lesser pays tithes to the greater. So Abraham is lesser because it was Melchizedek who blessed him, and it was Abraham who paid tithes to Melchizedek. So we're clearly establishing that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Make sense? Okay. So this is, now we have to unpack the significance of that. Um, uh, and we have to understand, I mean, it goes on now to develop this um, in, in under, so that we can understand the implications. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with Israel's ancestry, it will help us to review the genealogy of Abraham so you don't get lost in these names because these names represent a truth, and that's why it's used. It all began, the nation of Israel and the Mosaic Code began uh, with Abraham and his wife, Sarah. They had a son. His name was Isaac. The promise, the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham, all the promises were given to Abraham, unconditional covenant, everlasting covenant, still in effect today. That was passed from Abraham to Isaac. Then Isaac had a son named Jacob. He also had a son named Esau, but the promises were given to Jacob, and God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So you can, when you're talking about Jacob, you're talking about Israel. Israel, Jacob, Jacob, Israel. Now, Jacob slash Israel had 12 sons, and those 12 sons became 12 tribes, who became 12 nations. And each one of those tribes had were blessed with certain unique blessings. For instance, the tribe who is the third born son of Leah, it is Levi. That was the tribe where all the priests came from. So if you were a priest, you would come from the tribe of Levi. That was designated in the Mosaic law. So it wasn't by their election, it was, it was in the Mosaic code. Uh, the fourth born son of Leah is who? Judah. Judah. Have you heard of Judah before? Because, yes, Judah is the tribe of Jesus. Jesus, believe it or not, he was a Jew, and he descended from the tribe of Judah, and Judah was the tribe of kings. Nothing in the Mosaic Covenant or Code said anything about Judah being a tribe of priests. Who were the tribe of priests? Levi, the Levitical priest. Now, all of a sudden, we have Jesus 
from Judah. And we're going to have to wrestle with this. What does the significance of a priest who is coming from the tribe of Judah? So that kind of gives you an idea of the terminology and the people that are, does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so let's move on. And in verses 8 to 10, it says, In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives on. Now, just let me stop real quick. What tribe did Melchizedek come from? We don't know. No tribe. We were not given a tribe. No, no. And so we're going to find out why. Melchizedek, he did not descend from one of the tribes. Significant. All right. Um, and it's also significant that Abraham, let me make this point now before we move on. I meant to. Abraham, okay, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, the lesser to the greater. That was even before Levi was born. Levi, his son, the priestly tribe, hadn't even been born yet. So where was Levi? This is what the author is going to talk about. He was in the womb still of Abraham, uh, in, in an essence, he was great-grandson, but he was in the womb of Abraham, hadn't been born yet. When Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Abraham represented his whole family, which means you have Levi paying tithes to Melchizedek. Make sense? All right, I'm not making this up. Now we get an explanation for this <laughs> in verses 8 to 10. Let's work through that. It says, in this case, mortal men receive tithes. That's the Levitical priests. They receive tithes. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. Melchizedek. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. For he was still in the loins of, loins would be a better word, I guess, than womb. <laughs> Sorry about that. For he was still in the loins of his father Melchizedek, or of his father Abraham, when Melchizedek met him. Met him. Okay. So, that's where we have, we have the Levitical priest being mortal men, but we have Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek while Levi was still in his loins. So Melchizedek's death, as we talked about, was never recorded, which implies prophetically that he lived on. And verse 3 said that Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without genealogy, neither having beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So he mysteriously lives on, and Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham before Levi was born, which means implicitly that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. So quick summary of verses 1 to 10. Uh, this is where I tell you, trust the process. You're wondering, why do we need to know this? Well, it, it'll make more sense as we go on. Uh, but quick, let's a uh, quick summary of verses one to ten. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, king of Salem, and priest of the Most High God, who blessed Abraham. So, if you've got that, that's that's more than what probably I would say almost ninety nine percent of Christians understand. This is a difficult chapter, so you have to really understand it within the context. And y'all have been faithful to do that. A timeless truth that we learn about God: God made Melchizedek. To be like the Son of God, King of Righteousness, and King of Peace. Um, that's very significant. Now, as we mentioned, Melchizedek was not the Son of God, but he was made like the Son of God to point us to the actual Messiah, of whom Psalm 110.4 says, A thousand years before Jesus was born, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So just ask yourselves as you're wanting to get outside of your brain right now, um, think about how have you been blessed by the King of Righteousness and the King of Peace? How have you been blessed? If we know that Melchizedek was made like the Son of God to point us to the King of Righteousness and the King of Peace, um, how have you been blessed by him? 
and what choice tithes, if you notice it said Abraham gave the choicest of his spoils to Melchizedek. So what choice tithes and offering are you presenting to Jesus in the same manner that Abraham tithed to Melchizedek? Is it your choicest offerings, your choicest tithes? And what are those? Uh, sometimes we can begin to go through the motions, but we need to think about how we have been blessed by God, the greater, how we've been blessed by Jesus, the greater, and then what do we give to him in response? Uh, so any questions on this section? Patsy Lair, it's good to see you on too. And Nanette, I don't know if I was able to, to greet you, but is there any questions on this? And if you do, if you want to raise your hand, I can see you, or you want to drop it in the chat, I can do that too um, and address it there. But does anybody have any questions on this section or any comments? Um, anything you can think of before we move on? All right, y'all are quick. So let's go on now and look at the priesthood of Christ within the context of Melchizedek. And it tells us in verses 11 to 13, now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. What this is saying is if God's people had been perfected through the ministry of the Levitical priesthood, the priests from the tribe of Levi under the Mosaic Code, would there have been a reason for another priest to arise of a whole different order, of the order of Melchizedek? No. And so obviously there's an unmet need that is going to be fulfilled by the priest who is coming in the order of Melchizedek. Just as 110, Psalm 110, 4, and I'm purposely repeating this, uh, where it says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the prophecy said nothing of the order of Aaron, which would have been the old Mosaic covenant, who was the first Levitical high priest. Why not? <clears throat> because verse 12 explains that when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of the law also. So are we still under the Mosaic law? No. Not under the new covenant. See some of the implications that are coming from this. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a change in priesthood, which means there's been a change in the law as well. We're under a new covenant. Um, so... Uh, we're under a, a new law, the law of Messiah versus the law of the Mosaic Code. And so Hebrews 7.12 explains that when the priesthood is changed, there's a change in the law. We're no, under, no longer under the Mosaic law that's being administered or was administered according to the order of Aaron. There's been a change from Aaron, order of Aaron, to the order of Melchizedek. Order of Aaron to order of Melchizedek. Um, so, the law of Moses and the Aaronic order are very closely bound together because the Mosaic law was administered according to Aaron. Um, and so, if the Aaronic order was temporary, then the law of Moses was temporary as well. In fact, it was fulfilled by Jesus. It didn't, it wasn't abolished. It was perfectly fulfilled by Jesus because he is the superior priestly king, king and priest who has succeeded the previous order. Did he just do away with it? Absolutely not. He fulfilled it every dot and tittle. So it didn't go away. 
he fulfilled it. And Hebrews 7, 14 says, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So just about the time you think you've got this, you got to stop and go, okay. Um, Jesus was descended from Judah. No reference to anything. Um, Moses spoke nothing concerning priests in the tribe of um, Judah. So again, looking at our little chart here of Abraham's descendants, uh, you have the third-born son, Levi. That's where all the priests came from. You had Judah, who if you go back to Genesis 49, it's where that tribe was ordained as the tribe of kings. Nothing was said about there being a priest from the tribe of Judah. But Jesus descended from where? From Judah. From Judah. So we have to figure out what, um, what that means. And let's look back uh, to verses 1 to 10. Melchizedek was not only a priest, he was also a king. He was a priest and king. Um, and the priesthood of Jesus under the new covenant was according to the order of Melchizedek. So like Melchizedek was both a priest and a king, Jesus is going to be a priest and a king because he is under the order of Melchizedek, which is different than the Aaronic order under which, which was administered by the Levitical priest. Make sense? Okay, so uh, then we understand better why, why we have this, uh, why we need to understand Melchizedek. Verses 15 to 17, and this is clear, clearer still. <laughs> if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is attested of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus was declared a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek prior to his advent. This is prior, he didn't, he wasn't born through physical descent, wasn't according to the physical requirement that he had to be born of a certain tribe. He, according to the order of Melchizedek, received his priesthood on the basis of his indestructible life. Um, and that is um, what we know to be true of Jesus. He is eternal. He is immortal. He is indestructible. Verses 18 to 19 say, For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect, and on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So it's described here, the former commandment is described as what? Useless. Weak and useless. Why? Because the law had no power to overcome sin. The only power that the law had was to reveal sin. When you sit in a pitch dark room, you do not see all the critters. Brent and I were just talking, my brother Brent and I were talking before this uh, about the little critters. One chewed through his internet cord and I, in my prayer room, we are on a pier and beam house and I was praying and all of a sudden I heard this little rustling. I'm like, that sounds like a critter coming up, through, but we have a vent, so it, it couldn't get any further than that. Okay, as long as we're in the dark, we can't see them. You turn on the light, and what do you see? All the critters in the room, and those critters are our sin. So the only power that the law had was to reveal the sin. It's like shining a flashlight going, you thought you were whole and pure, pure but guess what? Just look at the light, and it shows the sin that's, that's in your life. And so when you turn that light on, everything becomes visible, and that's what the law did. Though there was nothing wrong with the law, the law reflects the perfect standards of God's righteousness. God is perfectly holy, and that holiness is revealed in his perfect law. So don't think there's anything wrong with the law. The only problem was is that, just because the law can call you what you are, a sinner fallen short of the glory of God, it doesn't have any power to overcome that sin. It can only just help you to become aware of your need for a Savior because you have fallen short of the glory of God according to the perfect standard of God's 
uh, law. And so that's the reason why there's a weakness and uselessness of the previous code because yes, we're bound by the law. It hasn't gone away and the law still has the power to condemn because it reveals in every way man falls short of God's glory. The weakness and uselessness of it is it had no power to do anything about it. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, there's a bringing in of a better hope. And through this hope, we're able to draw near to God, which we could not do previously because of our sin that was revealed by the law. Make sense? Okay. So just clarification here. Uh, so we have now former Mosaic Covenant. That's the Mosaic Law mediated by Moses, ministered according to the order of Aaron by the Levitical priests. So the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. The law came through Moses, mediated by Moses, ministered through his brother in the order of Aaron. And then that was ministered by the Levitical priest of the tribe of Levi. New covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Prophesied by Jeremiah, who was a prophet in 627 to 580 BC. That's where it was revealed that there would be a new covenant, not like the weak, useless previous covenant, but a better covenant. Now, this covenant would be mediated by Messiah, not Moses. Who's greater than, we've already learned that. Who's greater than Moses? Jesus. So the new covenant mediated not by Moses, but by Messiah inaugurated by his blood that was shed on the cross, ministered according to the order of Aaron? Nope. Melchizedek, who's priest and king, by Jesus. Not the Levitical priest, but by Jesus. So new covenant, new priesthood, new law, better promises. We'll get more into the covenant later. This is where we're at now. You're, you're building, you know, he builds the blocks so that we can understand the, uh, you'll appreciate it much more when you understand how we get there. So in verses 20 to 22, and as much as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Verse 22, so much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So for the second time in this chapter, the author is quoting Psalm 110.4. This is not a new creation by the church. This is what God intended all along. It says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Why? Because it's impossible for God to lie. And he has sworn with an oath. You, Messiah, Jesus, are a priest forever. This was the Levitical priest. They were never given an oath like that. The Levitical priests became priests without an oath, it says, and their priesthood was temporary. Why? Because they died. They were, they were not immortal. They were destructible. So their priesthood ended when they died. Now we understand why Melchizedek was priest perpetually, and that prophetically looked to Jesus, who is a perpetual priest. But Yahweh has sworn um, with an oath, will not change his mind, that Jesus is a priest forever. His life is indestructible, and so his priesthood is forever. And as long as Jesus lives, he will be a priest forever. Is Jesus alive? Yes. Oh, yes. Did he, did he die on the cross? Yes. Yep. Was he raised up? Absolutely. He rose from the grave to reign as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords forever. And you compare his indestructible life to the temporal lives of the former priest. And we understand how he is superior. Verse 23 says, the former priest on the one hand existed in greater numbers. Why? because they were prevented by death from continuing. So the former priests were continuous. Why? Because they had to keep replacing them. Each time a priest died, another priest would take his place, and they were prevented by death from continuing. 
Um, and what would happen if they didn't replace a priest when he died? There would be no one to make, yeah. The people would be separated from God, and there would be no one who could make offerings uh, for the sins of the people, and they would, they would be estranged from God. Now, you compare that to Jesus, who is on the other hand. Notice how the author keeps saying on the one hand, and then on the other hand. It's the former versus the latter. Uh, the lesser versus the greater. And so in verses 24 and 25, it says, but Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus lives forever. He holds his priesthood permanently because this has been sworn by God with an oath and it's impossible for God to lie. So what conclusion do we draw from this? Jesus is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus died on the cross for sin once for all time. He doesn't have to keep making offerings over and over again because he offered the perfect sacrifice of himself that forever destroyed the work of the devil. And Jesus was proven indestructible by his resurrection from the dead. Then after his resurrection, Jesus ascended. And where did he ascend and sit down? at the right hand of the Father, and that is where he lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through him. So, in light of the wretched sinners that we all hopefully were, and now we're a new creation in Christ being sanctified, uh, but we were all condemned by our sin, and it was necessary for us to have a perfect high priest with an indestructible life to make intercession for us. It says in verses 26 to 27, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. And so formerly we looked at the priesthood of Melchizedek. What did these verses tell us about the priesthood of Jesus? How is Jesus described as priest? First, verse 26 says he is holy. What's the significance of Jesus being holy? He is completely set apart from all that is common to man. And he lives to God to make intercession for us. He is holy. He is also, verse 26 says, innocent. What does it mean for him to be innocent? He is sinless. He has no reason to make uh, sacrifices for his own sins. Like the former prophets, they had, or the former priests, they had to make offerings for themselves before they could make offerings for the people. Jesus was sinless. Uh, verse 26, 26 says he was undefiled, undefiled by sin. Uh, verse 26, he was separated from sinners. And so Jesus, even though he came and dwelled in the midst of sinners, never sinned himself. And now in verse 26, it says that he is exalted. How high? Above the heavens. Who's above the heavens? God the Father, and he sits at his right hand. So he does not need daily to offer up sacrifices. He's sitting at God's right hand, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. And he, in verse 27, says, offered once for all when he offered up himself. Is there any reason for sacrifices to continue to be made? He finished. He's done. He made this. He fulfilled the law of sacrifice. People ask today, why aren't there still sacrifices going on? 
he fulfilled the law of sacrifice with the perfect sacrifice of himself. And verse 28 concludes this chapter, and it says, For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. So Jesus is not weak. He's not inferior. His majesty and glory are superior to the angels, superior to the former prophets, superior to Moses, superior to Aaron, and his priesthood is superior to the former Levitical priesthood that was according to the order of Aaron. That's the richness of this doctrine. The word of the oath of Yahweh recorded in Psalm 110.4 in 10th century B.C., came after, it says, the Mosaic law. So uh, it was by the oath of Yahweh, who will not change his mind because it's impossible for him to lie, he has appointed a son who is made perfect forever. So a summary of verses 11 to 28, Jesus descended from Judah and was made a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, and he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. And so a theological truth that's timeless, God has sworn with an oath, will not change his mind, that Jesus is a priest forever, and Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. We're going to find out more about that better covenant in the next chapters. And so as we consider the significance of this, who is your guarantee that you have been saved forever? Jesus. So um, when Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren, remember last week we talked about the highs and lows of the Christian life. We're on a high and we're like, we're saved. And then we go on the low and we're like, are we saved? And there's that, we're saved. Are we saved? We're saved. Are we saved? How do we get out of that vicious cycle of, having those victories followed by that, oh my goodness, that condemnation where we put ourselves under that spirit of condemnation. How do we know that that's a waste of time, that we don't spiritually have to go there just because Satan is whispering in your ear that you've done something wrong and you've lost God's pleasure or favor or whatever? No. Draw near to God through Jesus. And when you doubt if, if you're welcomed in the presence of God, you know what? Go boldly based on the perfect righteousnesses of his son because God will not turn away from you. He, you are able to draw near to God through Jesus. That's an open door. And there was one day this week where I verbally said, I will go to the Father any time I want to. And it is because of who Jesus is. That door will never Close to those who draw near to God through him. So the question is, how often do you draw near to God through him? How often? I mean, that is such a gift. How often do you draw near to God through him? Daily is, yeah, or more often, even throughout the day, sh shooting up those arrow prayers and the Holy Spirit is so faithful to, you know, whenever I, I start thinking about Elsie, I realize, hey, maybe that's the Spirit saying, pray for Elsie, you know, and anyone else that shares a prayer request, when that person comes to your mind, hey, Brittany's on the road, we need to pray for Brittany, stop and shoot up those little arrow prayers, because Jesus has established a kingdom of priests and kings, and we get to participate in the priesthood of Jesus through our prayers and intercession for each other. And when we pray, do you go to God through him and pray to the Father through Jesus with confidence that he hears and that he'll answer uh, because you've approached him through Jesus? It's never on the basis of our own righteousness. It's based on the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And one of the gifts Jesus gives us is the cloak of his perfect righteousness that, so that we can approach God um, without fear and without condemnation. So how often do you draw near to God through him? Any questions about this second section or any questions about this chapter um, that you have or any thoughts about that? And you, I'm going to 
I'm going to go, well, you guys put that in the chat if you have a question or raise your hand, get my attention and I'll unmute you. Um, or any thoughts that you have, any questions? You know, this is kind of a difficult chapter, but when you break it down, isn't it rich? And it's not that hard to understand. And if you don't understand all of you're sitting there going, well, I don't know if I understand how rich it is. Just keep letting it build because once we get to the new covenant, you're going to understand, okay, he's, it'll just all keep making sense. Um, so any other thoughts, any other questions, comments? Well, if not, let's close up. Uh, with a word of prayer. And then if you have those, uh, you feel free to, to chat and uh, afterwards as well. Father, we do love you. We do praise you for you are a great and faithful God, for you have given us the gift of your son. Father, this was your plan all along. And we're reminded that you are a God whose plans never fail. You never go to plan B because plan A, everything you plan, you do. Your purposes cannot be thwarted. And Father, we see that as here we saw the uh, Melchizedek making his appearance um, in Genesis 14. And then we see in the end of the New Testament, in Hebrews 7, you are so faithfully explaining to us the significance of that, that at the beginning of time in Genesis, in the middle of time um, during the Psalms, and here at the very end of the biblical record, you have shown us point A, point B, point C, how it all connects. And we're reminded, Father, that you are a God who transcends time, who transcends our circumstances. Father, you never are in heaven saying, oops, or wringing your hands, but instead you watch over your word to fulfill it in perfection, in your perfect eternal power, and Father, in your perfect time. And I pray as we study these doctrines that you will give us this high and holy view of who you are so that we can march through each day with complete confidence that your plans for us will not fail either. And we do pray that your best plans and purposes will be fully realized in our life, that as we study your word, that you'll renew our minds, that you'll renew our hearts, that we can align our lives with your plans and purposes. And so, Father, we just commit to you um, our lives as a living and holy sacrifice. And we pray, Father, that you will show us this week whatever adjustments we need to make um, to be able to serve you in the way and worship you in spirit and truth in the way that is most glorifying and satisfying to you. And Father, allows us to enjoy the riches in Christ Jesus that you have freely given to us in him. We give you thanks, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.